Yeah, welcome, 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 welcome. We are uh, we are here trying to share on my side. Uh, please love and share whatever you are. Love and share. Okay. All right. Judah Beatrice, I can see you there. Joanne, Jacqueline, Joy, Fabian, <laughs> Ken, Margaret, Gloria. I want to see shared, not just love. Don't give me hearts only. I want the gospel to go out. So love and also share. Okay, love and share, very important. That's what I'm trying to do here. Trying to share on my side. I don't know why it's not sharing. I don't like starting my message without sharing. Mm. Goodness, it's showing on my side. Okay. All right. I guess I just have to continue like that. Okay. Ken Great. You're there. Petronilla, have you shared? Say, let me love, have you shared? Pauline, you've loved and shared. Okay. All right, please get people. Get everyone in. Let we start the service. Okay. Better, better, better. Believe your day has been good. I'm just trying to make sure this thing appears on my page. I don't know why it's giving me issues here. Okay, I think this is now. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, we are good now. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I've been looking at the topic, uh, Kingdom Keys to Accessing Exceeding Grace. Kingdom Keys to Accessing Exceeding Grace. And um, this is day three, we started on Tuesday on this very powerful topic. Favor is the shortcut to destiny fulfillment. If there is anything called shortcut in life, favor is the shortcut to uh, destiny fulfillment. And when you're operating by favor, you are operating by divine frequency. You know, you, you're not operating by human standards. You're operating by divine frequency. And there is no success, brothers and sisters, without the equation of favor. In fact, um, Zechariah the prophet said, it's not by might, it's not by power. He said, it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. In other words, the equation of life is not in the physical realm. I taught us on Tuesday that there are three realms of influence. That is the spiritual realm. 
Then there is the mental and emotional realm. Then there is the physical realm. The physical realm is the lowest level of influence to a human life. Human lives are influenced mostly and highly by spiritual activities. Then, number two, by mental or intellectual or emotional activities. And then the third way to influence a human life is by the physical realm, something you can touch, something you can see, something you can relate with. Now, chapter 4 of Zechariah verse 6, he said, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. In other words, spiritual forces are the most powerful forces that influence human destiny. Whether these forces are demonic or they are diabolic, spiritual forces are the most, the most powerful forces that influence human life. You know, and that's why you find that an architect will come and make a drawing for a building and uh, he will be paid his own millions. Probably take him a week or some days to finish the drawing, but he will pocket a few millions. The people will come to do the manual work, the physical work, be paid probably a thousand a day or 1,500 a day. And the ones who will build it, build it physically. But the one who just sat down and tapped into the intellectual, emotional, or mental realm was paid more than those who do the physical work. And higher than this one of the mental realm is the one who had the idea. Because, you see, those are the three realms of life, three realms that influence human life. There is a spiritual, there is the mental realm. That is a physical realm, right? So if you think by just working hard and being very honest and uh, having a little savings here and there will make you successful in life, I'd like you to revise your notes and I'd like you to change the way you think because that is the longest route to destiny fulfillment. If at all, you're going to fulfill that destiny. You know, life is more than what you see, what you touch, what you smell, what you hear, what you feel. Life is more than the physical realm. Ecclesiastes chapter, this chapter nine, it says, the race is not to the swift. It says, I looked under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter nine. Chapter 9, verse 11. It says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. It says, but time and chance happeneth to all. So, is telling you that everything in the physical is subject to a spiritual law. Okay. So, and that's why we're talking about favor. Because favor is not something that you can touch. But at the same time, you cannot deny the results when it is over your life. When favor is upon your life, you can't identify it physical saying this is favor no but it's like the wind you cannot see the wind but you can see the effects of the wind when favor divine favor is upon your life it's not something physical that you can touch and say this is favor no but the effects of it in one's life uh, cannot be hidden it's evident to all, you know, just like beauty. You can't really define what is beauty, but when you see it, you know it. That's why they say beauty is in the eyes of who? The beholder. Uh, so favor is a spiritual virtue 
that when it comes upon you, it begins to bring physical results. Favor. It's a very, very powerful, powerful thing. So favor is not tangible, but it is real. It's not visible, but the effects are physical. You need this ingredient called favor. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, the Bible says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. And then it says, And in favor with both God and man. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. And when you look the word favor in the Old Testament, is also used interchangeably with the word grace in the New Testament. You must understand that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, uh, the translation from Hebrew to English. And then the New Testament was the translation from Greek to English. So the word favor in Hebrew, which is, is it charish or charis, depending on how or where you learn your English, it is the same root word, grace. So where you see favor, it can be replaced with grace. And where you see grace, it can be replaced with favor. Favor is the shadow of grace in the Old Testament, while grace is the substance of that shadow in the New Testament, because grace is Christ. Christ is grace himself. Favor. In the, that's what the Bible says, the Old Testament is a shadow, but the substance is Christ. So when you see the word grace, because you don't see a lot of favor in the Pauline letters, that is from the book of Acts. You don't see the word favor everywhere, but, but you see the word grace. And when you look at the root word of it in Hebrew, translated from Greek, the grace also means favor, right? So when you see favor, it talks about grace. When you see grace, interchangeably also means favor. So when I say grace and when I say favor, please don't be confused. I'm speaking about the same person who is Christ. For example, Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, it says, do not frustrate the grace of God. That word grace there is also favor. Do not frustrate the favor of God in your life. So I, I want to believe that uh, we are good, we are good. Uh, if I can just look at who is here, Sylvia. Grace also means favor. John is there, Grace, uh, Gracious, Betty, Fandi, Henry, Christine, Favor, Luceca, you there, Irene, Beatrice, Florence, and all that. This is good, this is good, this is good. Now. I want to go deeper into what I taught uh, on Wednesday, that is yesterday, and on Tuesday, Wednesday, and on Tuesday. One of the things that I brought to our attention, and I think this is very, very important, is that uh, favor is not a miracle. Favor is a reward. Favor is a reaction. Favor, and that's why you can, you determine the amount of favor that flows to you and through you. You determine. Please never forget that. It's not, it's not by luck. It's not as if, as in, uh, we just stay here. And we are praying, hoping that God will give us favor. No, no, no. Favor is not even a product of prayer. Although prayer can bring favor. But favor itself is not a product of prayer. Favor is a product of principles. You know, so it's not a miracle. So you don't wait for it. Please catch that point. It will really, really help you. Favor is not a miracle. So you don't wait for it. Favor is, uh, favor is not a miracle. You don't wait for it. Favor is, what do I call it? 
is a reward. Favor is a reaction to a law of God that you have decided to honor. I think that is the best definition. Favor is a reward to God's laws, principles, or precepts that you have decided to honor. So when you honor a divine law, the reward is favor. So favor is not really a miracle. It is a reaction or a reward when you honor a divine law or a divine principle. So, and that's why you determine the flow of favor in your life. Now, forget that. You should tell yourself, I determine the flow of favor in my life. Say it again. I determine the flow of favor in my life. I determine the flow of favor in my life. It's not God. It's not God. I like to make a statement here that is a bit deep, that uh, I really want you to understand it. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. You see, the truth is this. What you do first determines what God does second. Listen to this, and if you don't understand it, just pray the Holy Ghost to give you understanding. You determine the behavior of God in your life. Hmm. I determine the behavior of God in my life. I determine what you do will determine how God will be involved in your life. Let me repeat myself. What you do or you don't do will determine how God will be involved in your life. You know, we always think that it is God first and then us. Mm -mm. God moved in Christ Jesus and Jesus said it is finished. And that's why he says, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. He says, you come first. He says, draw, I wish you can get me that verse. It says, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. When you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. The extent of your involvement with God and his laws will determine his involvement in your life. And that's why we don't wait for change to come. That is how many have wasted their time. You don't wait for favor to come. You don't wait for seasons to change. You don't, listen. Listen to this. Time doesn't change anything. Time only reveals what has been there. So those of you who think that with time, things will change. With time, I know my marriage will be different. You know, with time, I know my finances will be with time, with time. Time never changes anything. Time only reveals what has been there. Change starts with a decision. Have you found that verse? James chapter 4 verse 8. Look at it. James chapter 4 verse 8. It says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It, say, it says, you come first. You come. The step you decide to take will trigger a divine reaction towards you. 
Any change that you desire and you have not seen is solely de dependent on the step you have not taken. All right, let's take it home. Uh, God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He's determined because of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember? And then Abraham decides to do what? He decides to plead with God. He says, Lord, if you find 50 righteous people, God says, no. If you find uh, 40, no. He, he came down up to, I think, 5 or 2 or 10, something like that. God could have destroyed. But what Abraham did saved the life of Lot and his family. What you do first determines what God does second. Your actions determine divine reactions. <laughs> Your actions will determine divine reactions. I've seen people wait for God to bless them so that they can do something. And they hope that money will come and all that. Not knowing it is the seed they have now. That when they sow it, it will trigger a divine reaction to come their way. Others wait for deliverance and for breakthrough. Not knowing that when they start praying and they start speaking towards their breakthrough, towards the deliverance, that is a time there will be a divine reaction. When it comes to our walk with God, God is all-knowing, but he only gets involved in our lives by what we do. And that's what the Bible says, he sought for a man to close up the edge. He sought. It's not that God does not know people. No, God knows people, right? He's all-knowing. But he was looking for men who had understanding. What you do first, how you get in, don't wait for things to change. You move for things to change. Don't wait for favor to come. You do yourself into the favor of God because favor is not a gift. No, it's not a gift. It is a reward. It is pegged. On certain things you do, or certain things you honor, that these things are laws. Are you catching the flow? And so when we talk about uh, when you talk about kingdom keys to accessing exceeding grace or exceeding favor, I'm just teaching you how to program your life for progress. You can program your life for progress. Stop wasting time by sitting, waiting for something to happen. That is how many have become bitter with church, many have become bitter with their pastor, many have become bitter with prophecies, and many actually now have started doubting, is this thing real? It is real. The only challenge is you have not taken responsibility. A pastor, who is the pastor of the largest church in the world, had an interview with Time magazine. And they asked him, what is the secret to your ministry? And he said, I teach people responsibility. That was the answer. He said, what? I teach people responsibility. Now, this is a man who now they're doing 400,000 people on a Sunday service, plus, and I think it's more than that. It's 450, 450, 500 in, in, on a Sunday service, when you count the accumulated services. I mean, for about half a million coming to your church every Sunday, it has never been seen. When he was asked, what is the key, what is the secret, he said, I teach people responsibility, and it's the richest church actually on earth. Now, when you talk about uh, wealth in terms of the charismatics, you know. And he said he teaches people responsibility and not true. 
when you hear Papa teach, he will not really, he's not an encourager. He, 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 he shows us our part. And until you start thinking that way, child of God, Christianity will be a burden. It will be a headache and a heartache because you'll be chasing after the wind. It will be like a dog chasing its own tail. Any faith that makes God absolutely responsible for the results is irresponsible faith. True Bible faith will always tell you your part to play for the blessings to flow, for the fever to flow. So what you don't have today is not because God has not given it to you. What you don't have today is because there is something you have not done. What you're ready for is ready for you. What you do first determines what God does second. Understand that? So when we talk about laws, laws to, uh, to, to accessing exceeding grace or uncommon favor, these are things that you hear and then you readjust your life and you start programming your life for progress and then you start seeing favor flowing your way. You program yourself to it. Favor doesn't land on people. Man, connect to it. Favor doesn't just fall on people. Men connect to it. It's not a mystery. No, favor is pegged on certain spiritual laws. And I pray that this favor will come upon in the name of Jesus. I said, I pray that favor and common favor will come upon your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. All right. Now, we looked at some laws here on our favor law. And I began yesterday now looking at the kingdom laws of favor. And law number one that I shared yesterday was the law of kingdom service. Okay? The law of kingdom service. And I think this is one important law, child of God, that you and I must learn to embrace and to consistently plug ourselves into it. Kingdom service. Kingdom service. You are first of all a Christian before you became a secretary in that office. You are first of all a Christian before you are a doctor. Your nature comes before your career. And if you are born again, your nature is Christ. So you are first of all a believer before you put your career, you are a Christian first before your career. And that's why every believer should have a place in their hearts and in their minds for the work of God. Serve God. Listen. If you are not serving God, you are losing favor. I forget that. If you are not serving God, you are losing favor. Let me repeat myself. Anytime you are not serving, you are losing. That's the law. Anytime you are not serving, you are losing. Kingdom service is the highway to a favor-filled life. The million-dollar question you should ask yourself today is, what are you doing in order to improve the work of God or to better the house of God or to facilitate the furtherance of the gospel. What are you doing? If you can't ask, answer that question in a split of a second, examine thyself whether you be in the faith. 
Number one thing that Moses was given by God is God tell Pharaoh to let my people go that they may serve. The reason why God blesses you is to serve. In fact, the reason why you are delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the reason why God saved you from your sins and now you're born again was not to give testimony that you're born again. God says, let my people go that they may serve me, that they may serve me, that they may serve me. The highest form of consecration as a Christian is your service to God. What are you doing to the house of God? Let me ask you. Oh, you say you're just an online worshiper. An online worshiper. And you know that this online thing is not bad. I mean, it's, it's, it, has, it, has, it has its own benefits. But I think it's also a demonic strategy to make people comfortable in their houses so that they don't get the chance to touch the dust of Zion. In Psalm 102, we read yesterday, verse 13, service, your service to God, to his work, and to his house, is what will determine the favor you will carry. Look at Psalm 102. Psalm 102. Verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. But verse 14, he says, how favor has come. For thy servants, not thy kings, no. Thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. These were sanctuary cleaners. These were sanctuary keepers. It says, for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. Favor is pegged to service. Favor is pegged to service. Favor is pegged to service. Oh, man of God, me, I serve, I serve, but this thing of favor, I don't understand it. But anyway, I serve, oh, no, 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 no. Serving God with understanding of what service is, is your highway to a favor-filled life. There is no one who serves God with the understanding of service that lacks favor. Because God says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, it says God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love in that you have ministered to his name and he still do minister. In that you have ministered and he still do minister. In other words, God, is no, God cannot forget your service. We read yesterday, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, uh, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always, not sometimes, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That means in season and out of season. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. No one serves God in vain. And serving God is not preaching. No, serving God is touching the work and the altar at your level based on the gifts, the talents, the callings, and the opportunities God has given you. Until you begin to think in terms of service, you'll be very far from the frequencies of favor. Nothing moves God like favor. Nothing moves God, sorry, like service. When somebody begins to serve, he has registered, he has registered his name in the school of favor. 
That's why remember yesterday we read Job 36 verse 11. Job 36 verse 11. What does it say? If they obey and they serve me, mm -hmm, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. When will this happen? Not only are they obeying, what are they doing? They're serving. They're serving. Kingdom service in the place where God has planted you is what qualifies you for a favor-filled life. Thou shall serve. Look at it. Exodus 23, 25. Thou shall serve. And then God shall bless. You know, honestly speaking, I can't understand how somebody can be in church and they're not in service. I don't, honestly, till today, I try to reconcile with my mind. How can you just come to church, listen to the word, and go home? I don't feel anything. Oh my God, we have missed the essence of church. Church is not a place you come for you just to receive the word and to be prayed for. It's not a place to look for miracles. I'm sorry to say, that is what the Kenyan church has missed it. We have missed it. Because, and it started with the American church. Because the American church, revival came from there. Then they go to a place where it became an entertainment something. A place where people get encouraged. Just, they came with this thing of one day at a time. What nonsense is that? That's not for church. The altar gives men an opportunity for service. It's not just a place where people hear the word of God. Because even the person preaching is offering service. So an altar is a kingdom opportunity for men to serve. It's not a place to come and just hear the word of God, then pray for me, then after that, ten, 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 and wait for a miracle. Oh, our pastor is not powerful. Since he prayed for me, nothing has happened. That is where many have missed it. That is the reason why we don't hear many testimonies. Let me be honest with you. In my few years in the Lord, 20 plus years, and I've traveled a little bit, the East African church, that is where we missed it. The West Africans, they have understood the power of service. You'll even find that, including Muslims in those West African countries, they will bring money to church. They will see church being built. They will buy a block. Church is not a place to hear the word of God only. You know, actually, church is an altar. And the first assignment of an altar is service. He told them through Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. The, the essence of deliverance, of salvation, of whatever God gives you is so that it can improve your service. Because how you touch the altar will determine how the altar will touch you back. Whether you serve by prayers, whether by giving, whether directly, whether indirectly, as long as you are touching the altar that is feeding your spirit, then you're qualified for a life of favor. Are they around? Before I continue, let me see what you guys are saying here. Are you guys catching the flow? Simon is saying amen. All right. Duncan, amen. Carol, anytime you're not serving, you're losing. Okay. Are you guys understanding my teaching this evening? Oh. Sylvia, yes, Dad, we are here. 
Okay, good, 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 good. See for catching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want more feedback. I don't want just to be here. And uh, you're not understanding it. In fact, I remember in Acts chapter 8 when Philip joined the Ethiopian eunuch, the first question he asked is, understand thou what thou readest. Uh, Simon, how, how you touch the altar determines how the altar will touch you good. Faith from Zambia, we hear you, man of God. Pauline, getting, getting blessed. Titus, yes. Okay. Are you catching the flow? Right. The altar is not just a place of hearing the word of God and going home. I want you to catch that. The first reason, the number one reason why God raises an altar among a people is so that the people can have an opportunity to serve. Please, let, let me repeat myself. One of the most important reasons why God will raise an altar is so that he can give a people an opportunity to serve. The purpose for your salvation, the purpose for your deliverance is to serve. Moses said, Pharaoh, let my people go. That they may do what? That they may do what? That they may serve me. That they may serve me. The essence of your salvation is not for you to testify. I'm born again. I love the Lord. Since I got born again, I've not seen anything to take me back. I thank God. That's not, the, that's not why God saved you. Your testimony is good. But it says, let my people go that they may serve me. Anything you need, healing, finances, deliverance, whatever, call it, is in your service. As a matter of fact, your degree of deliverance is determined by your commitment to serve. If you can just, from today, if you can just put your mind in how can I make the work of God, how can I, how can I make it easy for the gospel to be spread around? How can I touch the altar that is feeding my spirit? If that can be your focus, the deliverance you're looking for, the promotion you're looking for, the husband you're looking for, the healing you're looking for, it will come to you without sweat, without even prayer. That is a very, okay, let's look at it, chapter 6. Chapter 6, very, very powerful. Matthew chapter 6. Look, 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 look at God's formula of meeting our needs. We, we, we think that our needs moves us, moves God, sorry. Now, nataka unisikize vizuri. Your needs... God knows your needs even before you utter your needs to him. But God knowing your needs does not mean he will meet them. God is not moved by the needs of people. God is moved by the service they offer to his altar. That is what moves God. Pastor, are you saying that God will not answer my prayer? God will not move? And no, God knows. You know, knowing someone's need does not mean you meet it. How many people have we passed on the road and they ask for arms? We can see there is a need. But seeing a need does not mean meeting it. God sees the needs of his children, but meets them on the platform of service. I want to repeat myself. God sees the needs of his people, but he only meets this needs on the platform of service. Matthew chapter 6, look at it, verse 33. 
Very, very important. It says, but seek ye first. <laughs> In fact, maybe, maybe we should start from verse 25 so that you understand where it's coming from. Let's get there. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? I'm in Matthew chapter 6, now verse 26. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. I did not much better than they are we together. Let's verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the, val of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arid like one of these. Wherefore, verse 30, if God so clothed the grass of the field, look at it, ah, uh, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Then verse 31 now he begins to advise us. He says, Therefore, Matthew 6, 31, let's get there. Therefore, therefore, mm, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now look at verse 32, it says, for your heavenly father, this is powerful, knoweth. That you have need of these things. God knows your needs. But how does he meet your need? Verse 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom. Don't seek the needs out they are going to be met. It says, for your heavenly father know that you have need of these things. But, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. God knows our needs but meets us at the platform of our service to him. That is how important serving God is. There's a question I want to ask even before I go deeper. What is the involvement in the church that you serve under or that you worship? Or you're an online worshiper, no, no commitment to any church. Any man of God that blesses you, you watch. Eh? Ah, this one's talking about marriage, oh, you're there. Ah, this one is talking about dreams, you're there that week. Ah, this one is talking about career, talent, and all that, you're there. So who is your pastor? Which one is the altar? One of the wickedness, and I'll be very bold with this, one of the wickedness of COVID-19, and that's why I know it is demonic, is because... It is one of the diseases that does not allow people to gather on the old. We thank God for the precautions. But that was an orchestration from hell to hinder people from touching the walk. And that's why even during that time of lockdown, there are those who still knew how to touch the altar, how to serve God from a distance. Now that God has given us an opportunity, it is a double error. With the grace God has given you, you are still in the house. Yet you go to work. Yet you go to the supermarket. You still buy groceries. That COVID that cannot find you in the mall or in the public vehicle, that can only find you in church, is it not a selective COVID? You are able to board a public vehicle whereby there is no social distancing. You are seated here and the next person is seated here. Sometimes even three of you there. At least such the social distancing. Yet, you feel comfortable to enter a public vehicle, to go through, to go with an Uber. You feel very comfortable to be number. You even send your kids to school. Who mix with other kids? But when it comes to coming to church, you say you have to be careful. You know, it's social distancing. We just have to be very careful. That is the lie that Satan is propagating now in the minds of them whose faith is weak. Because Satan knows that the moment you start touching the altar, his hold over your life 
begins to get weak. Listen to what David said. So bless your heart. In Psalm 27. Listen to what David said. Concerning the altar. Psalm 27. Oh. Oh. Verse 1. Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this, hallelujah, will I be confident. Verse 4, what will he be confident in? It says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell, hallelujah, in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire, where? In his temple, his desire, his affection was the work of God was the house of God, was the temple of God. And that's why God says, I found David, a man after my own heart. Anytime your affection goes towards God and his house, his affection goes towards you and your house. Hmm. Let me repeat myself again. Anytime your affection goes towards God and his house, his affection moves towards you and your house. You must find a place in your local assembly. Even if you are a member from afar, from that distance, you must find a way of serving God through the altar that blesses your heart. If favor is to be your second name, you must. There's no shortcut to it. You must. You must. You must. Let me see what you're saying here. Bethlehem, Omega Child, Amen. Martha favored, okay. Faith, that is my wife saying, Amen. Simon Fortune, Amen. All right. All right, Sylvia, seeing a need does not mean meeting them. God sees our needs, but He will only meet them if He does. If find you, He only meets them if He finds you in the place or platform of service. Titus. He's saying powerful. Are, are, are you guys understanding me? <sighs> Serving God. Your highway to a favor-filled life. What do you do in the house of God? Or you say that uh, I've checked, I've checked around our church, wherever you go to church. And I don't see where I fit. I don't see. I don't know what I can do. Create your own service group. Go to the man of God. Let him bless it. You automatically become an HOD. There is always something to do in the house of God. There is always something for you. David said... In Psalm 92, I believe. Look at it. Psalm 92, verse number 12. Psalm 92, verse 12. David says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Verse 13. Look at verse 13. This is powerful. Oh, this is powerful. Those that be planted in the house 
of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our gods. Not, 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 not those who visit. Not those who just attend. It says those that be planted. Those that be planted. They are involved in the work. It will surprise you that people will pray for a fundraising to take a loved one to hospital, but they cannot give that money for their church to be built. Yet they expect God to heal their patient. That is, you know, that's what the Bible says. Draw nigh to me. And I'll draw nigh to you. Is how you approach God. Your actions determine divine reactions. You have time to attend a funeral committee for your friend for one week, every evening for two hours with your mask. You're there listening, but you have no time to attend one weekly service. Yet you're believing God for promotion to the place of work. Look at the kind of dishonesty your heart is. That's what the Bible says. The heart of man is highly wicked. A friend of yours has passed on. Ah, you can sit in those committee meetings every Monday to Friday, two, three hours. You even pay. See, you're raising money to take your friend, you know, for an honorable send-off. But for you to attend an evening service, just to have communion, or to talk to God, excuses from me until Japan. Then you're the same person you're saying you're believing God to bring a right partner to you. Are you serious? Are you really serious with this God? Though the seat you sit on in church, you don't even know how it was bought. Your work is just to come and say, my God, the praise and worship is so good. Oh, our church is beautiful. Oh, my God, I just love so and so. Oh, I just love the Sunday school. Oh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Whatever you worship, appreciate where you worship and the people there. But that is not what will bring favor your way. Are you involved? Are you touching the work? It's not what you did. What are you doing now? No one graduates from kingdom service. We only make progress. Mm? No one graduates from kingdom service. We only make progress. Look at this. Those, Psalm 92 verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts. Of our God, they shall still bring forth fruit when in old age. Mm. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. To show that the Lord is upright and he is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. Glory to God. Service. Favor is as a result of your service to God. Let that sink deeply in your heart. Now, tomorrow, in the evening service, is a breakthrough service. Here in church, I'm still in the office. I'm still serving. <laughs> I'm still serving. At 6 tomorrow, p.m. to 8, I'll be looking at now the laws of service. How do you serve? I will put understanding in your heart because understanding determines your reward. It's not just serving. It is doing it with understanding. The Bible says, Proverbs 4 verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all thy getting, do what? Get understanding. Psalm 119 verse 144. 119 verse 144, it says, The righteousness of thy testimonies are everlasting. It says, Give me understanding, and I shall live. Your life is determined by your understanding. So tomorrow we'll look at how to serve. It's not just serving. How do you serve? What are the things you need to observe in order to serve for a reward of favor? Is how to go about it. Sylvia says, no one digests from kingdom service. We only make progress. Deep. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
Martha, amen. Are you guys getting blessed? Are you catching what I'm trying to say here? Talk to me. Oh. Pauline, God doesn't bless you according to your needs, but according to the platform of your service to the altar. Mm. Simon, God meets our needs on the platform of service. You got it, guy. Jeremy, getting blessed, daddy. The lecturer himself from Dar es Salaam, our lecturer here, Eric, church is not just a place to listen to the word of God, but an altar which gives the faithful an opportunity to serve. You got it. You got it. You got it. Okay. Simon Fortune says, yes, dad, we are getting blessed. Sylvia, yes, dad, really blessed. A rain abundance, getting it well, well. What are you getting? I want to know what you're getting. What are you getting, please? I, yes, you see, like Duncan says, sir, with understanding. Those are the things I want to hear. Talk to me. What has entered? You know, Revelation chapter 1 says, the things you hear and the things you see, do, do what? Right. I'm telling you the truth. I lie not in Christ Jesus. The moment you commit your life to service, that is the day you have started living the true Christian life. You will never lack favor in anything. Most of us started very well, or most of you started very well, but then along the way, your zeal, your enthusiasm dwindled because of the cares of this world. Oh, business started, oh, kids came, oh, you know, my husband, my husband, my husband. I don't know, this thing of husband, you used to serve God before God married. Now my husband, my husband, my husband, you're making a very big mistake. What you did to bring that husband is what you keep doing it to keep him. You got that husband on the platform of service. That business you opened because you began serving God and God started blessing you. You started going to Turkey the moment you start touching the altar. Now you're so busy flying everywhere, you can't even find an opportunity to serve God. It's not safe for... It is the altar that maintains the blessings in our lives. Anything in your life that is not maintained through kingdom service is temporal. Any blessing that you're enjoying now and is not tagged to your service to God is temporal. Sooner or later, you lose it. Only those things maintained by kingdom service last. Huh? All right, Judy Joe getting blessed. Faith, favor catching it, Daddy, loud and clear. Sophie, if you're not serving God, you're losing favor. That was a very deep point, Sophie. Sylvia, you determine the behavior of God in your life. Favor is not waited for, but connected to. Yes, remember I said that uh, favor is not a gift. It's not a gift. It's, you don't wait for it. You connect to it. To it. Are, we, are we blessed today? Are you catching the flow? Mm. Titus, what a powerful word. All right, all right, all right. Good, 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 good. What else have you learned? Please talk to me. Just throw it here. I want to read it. Can only catch favor by serving on the altar I feed from. I caught this one, Daddy. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, he said that they may be meeting in my house. You must get involved. Any altar that feeds you regularly, you're obligated to serve that altar. You know, this generation of online is where you see members who eat from one church on Facebook and then they go to another church on Sunday and they use the notes of the Facebook pastor and the anointing of the Facebook pastor to run their lives, but then they are committed somewhere on Sunday, that is the highest level of deception in your life. The Bible says, draw nigh unto me, and I draw nigh unto you. And then it says, ye double-minded people, please correct yourself. And then James chapter 1 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He says, let not that man think he will receive anything from God. You better be honest with yourself. 
Sylvia says, yes, daddy catching the flow. What you do first determines what God does second. I think, Sylvia, that point has sunk deeply in your spirit. Irene, service in the altar maintains favor in your life. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Irene, that one is very, very powerful. Ensure that the altar is being serviced regularly from your side. And then you involve your children. Then involve your relatives. How you touch the altar will determine how the altar will touch you back. How you touch the altar. You have a need. There is a case in court. It has dragged for many days. Apart from fasting, <laughs> You are fasted enough. Things don't change you. Throw yourself into kingdom service. Identify an area in the house of God and serve and see what will happen to that case. You must learn to peg your life to the altar. The battle of life is the battle of altar. The altar will speak for you to the extent you serve it. So somebody say, I know the altar is speaking for me. Oh, the altar is speaking for me. The altar will speak for you to the extent you serve it. Because an altar is a spiritual thing. And service, although you do it physically, but it's more spiritual than it is physical. Jeremy, so blessed. We must have God. That was the only purpose for why God created us. And the altar will stand with us. So blessed, Dad. Okay, good, good, Jeremy. Sylvia, again, you determine the amount of favor that flows to your life and through you. Yes, Dad, it has really soaked. Sifa, how much you touch the altar will determine how the altar will touch you back. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your children tonight that there will be a flow of favor. Even them tuning in and being connected is a sign and a desire that they want to serve. I pray, Lord, that everyone listening to me, watching me, will experience uncommon favor in the name of Jesus. Will experience uncommon favor in the name of Jesus. Will experience uncommon favor in the name of Jesus. Will experience uncommon favor in the name of Jesus Christ. Your life will be an expression of God's favor. Your business, your family, your career, your health, anything you do from now, from this altar of Miracle Life Assembly, receive favor, receive favor, receive favor, receive favor, receive uncommon favor, receive favor, receive uncommon favor in the name of Jesus Christ. Favor is your portion. So shall it be. So shall it be. So shall it be. So shall it be. In Jesus' blessed name. Amen. And amen and amen. Now, it's time for us to serve God with our givings. Very, very important. It's part of service. It's part of service. There is offering and then there is giving as part of service. I know, I know people who, they're not prayerful. They, you not find them cleaning the church and all that. But this is what they give to God as kingdom service. And it's working for them. Right? So let's start first of all with tithes. You're paying your tithe or you're redeeming a vow you made to God. Or it is a fast fruit you're offering to God. I want to start with you. And then let everyone who has been connected to this program tonight gather their offering, your seed of favor. Those in US, those in Europe, those in different parts of Africa, gather your seed of favor. Connect to the grace in the house. It will really, really, really help you. He says, none shall come before me what? Empty handed. Don't give based on what you have. I've always advised you. Give based on how you've been blessed in the service, the need of your heart, and the depth of love that you have.
towards God. Those are the things that inform your giving. Like now, we are talking about favor. How much of this favor do you want? That need of your heart should inform how you offer to God. Okay, let me start with tithers first. Father, thank you for every tither, every fast fruiter. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless them and increase them in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, I touch every seed sown, every favor seed sown, every worship given now. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that favor will answer to this seed that they're giving to the altar. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you're doing it as unto God. And please remember, it is your own faith that will deliver you. So God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. We need to close this service in the name of Jesus. Uh, when you close this service, you're lifted for life. Oops, sorry. You're lifted for life. All right. All right. Uh, okay. What is this one saying? You see, Papa, my tithe and my seed okay it's well well received all right all right now uh tomorrow at 6 p.m if you're in kenya and if you're in nairobi get here physically garden asset road 300 meters from thicker road super highway exit seven let's worship be on the altar your physical presence is part of service. It's very, very important. But then on Sunday, we have a very special service. Carry a bottle of anointing oil. Carry a bottle of anointing oil. It will be our covenant day of the oil of fever. It's an impartation service. Don't miss it for anything. Don't miss it for anything. Because the rest of this year will be the best of this year for you. But for that to be a reality, you need something to come upon your head. That thing is called favor. First service at 9 a.m. And then second service, the impartation service at 11 a.m. Both services are equally important. Come ready to receive from God in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the third service, which is at 4 p.m., you're going to be having our um, atmosphere for miracles manifest in the spirit realm. And it's really coming out so, so well. So uh, catch it for that in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your children. I pray, Lord that they will increase in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Always remember, favor is not a miracle. It, has a re it is a reward to a law, a divine law you have decided to honor. Don't wait for favor. Connect to it. God bless you. Bye-bye.